Okay, uh, let's get started, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to my class this morning. Uh, in the schedule, the, the class is How We Won the Drug War. A little overly optimistic um, misinterpretation of what I told them I was going to be speaking about, which is why we are winning the drug war. <laughs> but I am very optimistic about the prospects for ending the war on drugs. And for some reason or another, I always have been. And I've been writing about this subject um, for 30 years now. Uh, and 30 years ago, it seemed very, very bleak. But I always, from the very beginning, I always understood uh, the war on drugs to be an irrational type of policy that was doomed to failure. And what I'm going to I'm going to talk about the war on drugs, but I'm going to begin with the way in which societies change. And basically, there is, in some sense, the will of the people that really does matter. No government, no state, can maintain its power without the majority of the people going along with the state, not in active opposition. Once a certain crucial number of people in a country stop believing in the state or stop believing in a certain policy, that's when things actually change. And so how do we get that kind of change? How do we get that ideological change? Well, basically, uh, thinkers from the Austrian tradition have always believed that you have to have science, you have to have a logic, you have to have a consistency to your point of view. And you have to be able to demonstrate the inconsistencies and the failures of the view that you're actually opposing. So basically, it's having science plus experience that leads to changes in ideology. <coughs> and that's basically what we're doing here in general, is that we're showing you Austrian economics, the science of economics, economic theory, and its logic. And you're not really required to know every single step along the way. Like you're probably thinking, I really need to go back and re-listen to that lecture by Jeff Herbener, because I didn't get every single step. You don't need to memorize um, and know word for word, line by line, those complex processes of logical deduction. But you have to be exposed to it, and you have to at least see the logic in it. So what, what we're all about here is Austrian economics and then adding that historical experience to reinforce your understanding of the differences between the market economy and state action. And I've listed some historical experiences here some of them better illustrations than others, but basically what we've got here is a long period, many decades long, where our experience, the historical information, backs up what Austrian economists have been saying for 165 years. West Germany and Japan after World War II their economies were completely obliterated and all of the government regulations and taxes and all price fixing and all that stuff was also wiped out. And West Germany and Japan soon became the fastest growing, some of the largest and most efficient economies in the world. We can compare North Korea versus South Korea. You've probably all seen that um, satellite image of the Korean Peninsula at, at night. And most of South Korea is all lit up with lights, and North Korea is almost completely dark. 
because they don't have electricity or lights. They're so poor. Uh, the difference between East Germany and West Germany, the difference between Hong Kong and Taiwan versus Maoist China, the difference between Maoist China, where basically you had 700 million people starving to death, by and large, versus mo modern uh, China, which has now become, at least in nominal terms, the world's largest economy. You go down, you see the breakup of the Soviet Union, and even um, marginal changes like Margaret Thatcher's uh, changes in the UK economy, Ronald Reagan's marginal changes in the US economy, uh, the history of Chile in South America, and the history of Sweden, which was one of the most wealthiest countries in the world. And then they adopted state socialism or democratic socialism, and they soon sank to the bottom of European living standards. And in the 1990s, they had to reform themselves. So it's this kind of historical information that backs up the science of Austrian economics and buttresses libertarian ideology, the belief in a free market system, in a free society. So in terms of why we are winning the drug war, where are we now? Well, this is widely known, but we'll go through it anyways. Um, recreational marijuana has been legalized in several states. Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Alaska. Uh, medical marijuana has been legalized in over 20 different states. Marijuana has been decriminalized effectively in many other states, including California. Uh, marijuana as a legal and police issue has been reprioritized in many jurisdictions. For example, in Philadelphia, um, the uh, police uh, of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, have basically been told to make recreational marijuana consumption their lowest priority. As a result, the number of arrests has fallen uh, tremendously. And then Portugal decriminalized all drugs. So whereas the good news is mostly in the category of marijuana, the country of Portugal decriminalized all drug use, including heroin, cocaine, morphine, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you were caught with a small amount, the penalties were rather trivial, at least on the first offense. If you were uh, continually getting uh, caught with even small amounts, eventually you'd have to see counselors and medical uh, counselors and so on. And Portugal has gone from a country that was really had a tremendous drug problem, had a lot of overdose deaths, uh, the addiction rates were very high, the transmission of diseases by dirty needles was very high. And now Portugal, um, despite decriminalizing and making it essentially legal to consume these drugs, now represents one of the best cases in Europe. They have the lowest overdose death rate uh, in Europe, and they have one of the lowest uh, disease transmission through dirty needles rates in all of Europe as well. And basically, with all these experiments, um, and some of them were faulty, to, admittedly, there were no disasters. Okay, Colorado uh, did not implode. I've looked at all the social indicators in terms of crime, drug use, addiction, uh, problems at school. You know, there's like 20 of these social indicators that are related to drug use. None of them exploded. Most of them have actually um, decreased since uh, marijuana legalization there. So no disasters and mostly improvements. Uh, there was a study on needles used to inject uh, dangerous drugs like heroin. Uh, and they looked at countries from around the world and there were some countries that offered free needle exchanges or allowed you to buy needles at the pharmacy. And uh, there were other countries where 
needles were basically prohibited. You couldn't buy needles. Uh, you couldn't be prescribed needles. If you needed an injection, um, other than some cases, uh, basically uh, you were prohibited from accessing needles effectively. And what they found was that the rate of HIV infection uh, and other blood diseases was uh, very low in countries that provided free needle exchanges and was very high in the countries where they were prohibited. So the historical information, the recent information about uh, moving in the direction of legalization and away from prohibition has all been good. And the reason that I'm optimistic about further gains in towards legalization, I guess there's several of them. Uh, in the United States, for example, people who uh, now the majority of Americans support legalizing recreational marijuana. About 85% of Americans support legalizing medical marijuana. And if you look at the demographics within those polls, what you find is that young adults overwhelmingly support both legalizing medical marijuana as well as legalized recreational marijuana. And all basically all the young categories um, support legalization. Once you get up into uh, the 55 to 65 group, it's about split 50-50, and 65 and older still support marijuana prohibition, which means that we're going to make progress towards legalization one funeral at a time. <laughs> and other information that I have that is not really publicly known, uh, but some of you may be aware of this, is that in many European countries, in some areas of South America, um, and I imagine elsewhere where I don't have contacts, is that it's... Um, it's a well-known secret that the police are not interested in busting people and arresting people for uh, small amounts of re for recreational purposes, uh, particularly of marijuana. So that it's not hasn't been publicly reprioritized, but effectively it has been reprioritized that marijuana consumption is their lowest priority. Uh, and another thing that isn't widely known is that the United Nations is going to be reissuing uh, a statement regarding global drug policy. And the U.S. has been able to strong arm the U.N. into organizing the worldwide war on drugs. But it's my understanding that in 2016 they're going to rewrite those policies and those guidelines and it's going to be a completely, or hopefully, a completely different picture that instead of prohibition, they're going to go in the direction of harm reduction. And that's effectively going to cut loose a lot of these European uh, countries and other countries from around the world who do want to change their policy, but also want to comply with uh, UN guidelines. Okay, now the support, the ideological support for prohibition uh, comes from, of course, prohibitionists, uh, people who believe that consuming certain uh, drugs is immoral and therefore should be shot, stopped, uh, as well as economists and their modeling of the market for illegal drugs. Historically, economists have uh, supported uh, the war on drugs early on, and uh, the alcohol prohibition in the United States, economists were strongly in support of uh, alcohol prohibition. It's only been in recent years where some economists have come forward with at least um, recommendations for harm reduction rather than uh, prohibition, which in, would involve legalization and decriminalization of certain drugs. But in general, the prohibitionists and historically economists have believed that this following 
argument. First, prohibition increases the price of the product it's placed on. You make something uh, risky in the sense not of risking to use, but risky to being captured by the authorities and put in prison or, or heavily fined. So prohibition increases price. Higher price reduces consumption. Reduced consumption is a good thing, according to both of these groups, because it reduces addiction, violent crime, property crime, corruption, and lots of health problems associated with alcohol and illegal drugs. And if you pose the question about legalization to these, particularly prohibitionists um, and uh, drug war bureaucrats, uh, they would see legalization as an utter disaster. And I've come across that phrase in the literature at least a half a dozen times. And I also, last summer, uh, I was invited to Oxford uh, University for the Oxford Union debates, and they were debating the question of should we end uh, the global war on drugs? And I, of course, was on the legalization side, uh, the other side had um, a social worker uh, dealing with illegal drugs and, um, and a bureaucrat from, a drug war bureaucrat from the United Kingdom uh, government and a couple others. But the bureaucrat actually made the argument that if we legalize drugs, that very soon that everybody in the UK would be addicted to heroin. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a remarkable argument. And it's the type of argument that you see consistently from the prohibitionist side. And you can see the sort of arrogance and ignorance of the prohibitionists, when you go back and look at some of the justifications for the war on drugs. The Harrison Narcotic Act, which made opium, heroin, uh, and cocaine illegal, was based on the notion that, uh, well, basically it was an attack on African Americans in, in the United States, as well as uh, Chinese Americans in the United States. And they said that um, because of morphine, excuse me, because of uh, uh, opium, that white women were cohabitating with the Chinamen. <laughs> and that um, cocaine made African American males in the South impervious to bullets. <laughs> and wanting to rape white women. So it was blatant racism and discrimination. Um, the Marijuana Tax Act um, also uh, noted that uh, marijuana was being used by illegal Mexican immigrants. So this is, a, this is a, something that's old hat, really. And that um, marijuana would cause you to go insane and die. <laughs> and that if you lived, that you would soon progress to cocaine and heroin, morphine, opium, be, be, a, you, be your own personal pharmacy, basically. And some of this, um, excuse me, some of this was based on the movie Reefer Madness which um, I've never actually been able to watch the whole thing. Uh, it's pretty funny, but it's, it's considered one of the worst movies of all time. <laughs> but it's, it's all about scaring people. Um, you know, it's just, you know, one puff of marijuana and the sex, the guns come out, people are shot, people are raped, people run people over in their cars. Um, all in very quick succession. 
uh, the Comprehensive Drug Control Act of 1970 was uh, sort of a reorganization of the drug war at the time with the idea of Nixon declaring his war on drugs, really for the first time using that phraseology, and also is it sort of a, um, a way of attacking the hippies who were overrunning America and uh, were in defiance of American values. So all of these laws were based on the idea of outrageous claims against minority groups, basically. And uh, the vast majority of Americans were easily fooled by this propaganda, primarily because it was outside of their experience. They didn't have anything to tell them otherwise because a lot of these, the use of these drugs was largely restricted to small minority groups. And, uh, and as a result, the average American was easily fooled and taken in by this propaganda. They had nothing to lose. They didn't like the people that were using these drugs anyways. Uh, now, the, the average American was using uh, narcotic drugs. One quarter of 1% of Americans were addicted to um, something stronger than marijuana. Most of those people were addicted intentionally. In other words, they had arthritis, they had back issues, they had cancer, um, and the, the only thing that would help them would be something like heroin or morphine, or cocaine. The marijuana gateway theory is the idea first proposed by Harry Anslinger, who was in charge of the federal government's war on drugs uh, after the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937. And he went up to testify in front of Congress, repeating the claim that marijuana would make you go insane and then die. And then a doctor got up from the American Medical Association and said, well, Mr. Anslinger, that's not actually true. We've been using this product in the medical profession for hundreds of years, and no one to this point in time has either gone insane or died from this product. So Mr. Anslinger got back up and said, well, that may be true, but if you try marijuana, you're going to very soon want something stronger like cocaine or heroin or morphine or opium. And hence the gateway theory that marijuana was a gateway to harder drugs was born. Fortunately, social scientists have completely debunked this gateway theory. So on any one of, I think, five different grounds, there's no connection, there's no logical connection of this gateway theory. Physiologically, psychologically, the only thing that does connect marijuana with other drugs is the fact that marijuana is illegal. So once you tried marijuana, that means that you know somebody who sells illegal stuff. <laughs> That's the only valid connection. Okay, so let me look at the, some of the science of, uh, of pro, uh, prohibition. Okay, and this is a simple supply and demand chart of a product. It could be marijuana, it could be cocaine, it could be anything. And basically what you have here, the red line reflects the demand for this product. The blue line reflects the supply of the product. The equilibrium price is going to be $30, and this would be the equilibrium quantity. What prohibition does is it makes supplying the product more difficult. So this, as a result of prohibition, the supply curve shifts, making it more difficult, and the resulting equilibrium shows that the quantity has fallen and the price has risen. That's what the prohibitionists say. That's what actually happens in real life. Well, we should begin by noting this quantity declines. What does that actually mean? 
who's actually stopping buying this product because it's prohibited? Is it somebody who's having a hard time addicted to this product? Or is it going to be somebody who is not really addicted, doesn't really consume much of it, and is afraid of getting caught? In other words, a, a, a law-abiding citizen who's not a drug addict or, or anything of the kind, well, that's the people who cut back. The addicts don't cut back. So what prohibition does is it opens up. This is the cost, roughly $25, and this is the new market price, roughly $35. So it costs you to produce the product even less than it did, and now the price is greater than it previously was. And you don't have to pay it, the, the dealers don't have to pay a tax. There's no extra expense. You just incur the risk of being caught. So this creates extra profits for drug dealers. Prohibition increases the profitability in terms of revenue from dealing drugs. So you've created an incentive for drug dealing. And if you make prohibition even more stringent, you drive the price higher, you drive the cost of production, the basic cost of production, lower, and you open up this enormous new profit. It's really revenues, because you do face risk. The iron law of prohibition. I'm not really going to go through um, the mechanics unless we can get to it later. Uh, but this is based on what's called the Elchin and Allen effect. You can look that up on Wikipedia. And basically what the Elchin and Allen effect explains, well, it all started with a letter to the editor to the Seattle Times. In the state of Washington, they grow a lot of apples. And this lady in Seattle was mad that there were no good apples in the grocery stores in Seattle. All the good apples had been shipped out, and the only things that were left were kind of gnarly, oversized, undersized, odd-looking apples. Well, Elchin and Allen responded to this claim by this woman by showing exactly why the good apples are shipped out and the bad apples stay where, the, where they're produced domestically. And basically it's because of the transportation cost. It's expensive to ship apples from the state of Washington to, sta to say this, um, the state of Alabama. And so if you're gonna incur that transportation charge, you're gonna send out your best stuff. This is why the best lobsters from Maine are shipped out and none of the bad lobsters are shipped out. It's why the best potatoes of Idaho are shipped out and the bad ones are consumed locally. I was in Idaho for one night and uh, ordered a steak and baked potato. And the potato, the baked potato that they brought out was like this big. And I thought, that, that's the largest potato I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was also one of the worst potatoes I've had in my life because it's really hard to cook a baked potato that, that, that's that big. So Elchin and Allen have established why the good apples are shipped out and why the bad apples uh, stay in the domestic market. But this can be applied to illegal drugs as well. And as a matter of fact, at the lower part of the example here, marijuana in South America, you know, the, the price of a high-potency version is, say, $10 a pound. The low-potency version is about $5 a pound. And so you can get two pounds of the low-potency for one pound of the high-potency. Now, if you go to marijuana in South Carolina, you have to add about $1,000 to the price of a pound of marijuana. The risk and transportation charge from getting from 
uh, South, say, Columbia, South America, to Columbia, South Carolina, say, is roughly $1,000 per pound. Well, if you're going to go to the expense and the risk of running marijuana from South America to, to South Carolina, the economics dictate that you purchase the high-potency version in South America and bring that version to South Carolina. So the stronger the prohibition, the stronger and more potent drugs become. Uh, when I did my dissertation, the, uh, the data that I had um, illicitly gotten from the government was, uh, showed that from the early 1970s, marijuana was about 0.4 of 1% potent. By the mid 80s, marijuana was 4% potent, or 10 times what it was in the early 70s. Today, the potency of marijuana is uh, averages around 10%. But most of the market has turned away from marijuana and has moved on to stronger things like cocaine, crack, heroin, and uh, crystal meth. And in more recent years, they've turned away from those substances to artificial chemical uh, versions of opiates that are much more dangerous. Uh, and actually, they are deadly. Uh, they're very destructive. So as we've seen, the prosecution of the war on drugs has only led to stronger, more dangerous drugs. So we admit that drugs are, right now, uh, very dangerous. But they're dangerous because they're illegal. And that most of the market has been pushed away from drugs that are less addictive and less harmful, like marijuana. And it's been pushed in the direction of things that are highly potent, very small, such as heroin and such as these synthetic opiates. So prohibitionists say drugs are dangerous. That's why we need to prohibit them. The economics dictate that the drugs are dangerous because they are pro prohibited. And then, you know, when the, um, when the prohibitionist and the economist look at this market, shift supply, raise price, decrease quantity, that's price theory. We've raised the price, we've reduced the quantity. The Austrian looks at this situation and says, the price is really important, but it's not the only thing. Because everything else about this marketplace has changed, and none of it shows up on a supply and demand graph. Okay, the way it's produced, where it's produced, who produces it, how is it processed, how is it packaged, what information does it have on it, what are, are the company's standards and policies, how is it distributed, how is it sold at retail. Everything about a prohibited product changes, and it changes all for the worst. And much of this can be seen here regarding the legal and economic framework. There's no rule of law in a prohibited market. Uh, violence uh, has to be used to enforce contracts and sales territories. Um, that should be addiction, not additions. Uh, but people do commit crimes uh, to finance their habits. And when I was over in Oxford, um, I was talking to one of my team members and he said that it's, it occurs a lot where people, addicts, will go into a grocery store, fill up their buggy, and then just simply go out. Go, not pay and just run out of the store with a, a cart full of food. And they're using the food to sell the food, not to eat the food, in order to finance their habit. Um, causes bribery and corruption. It undermines civil society, which in my view is... Uh, everything that's non-government, uh, such as organizations, churches, the family, and so on. 
uh, and it stymies economic development. Okay, so when we look at areas where the drug trade is most active, we also find uh, economies which are, uh, are actually regressing in terms of economic development. And the two most noteworthy uh, of these are urban areas in America and the countries of Central America, where basically civil society and government have broken down uh, into chaos, which is one of the reasons why um, this past summer thousands of Central American children as young as age eight would make the difficult journey from Central America to Mexico to try to get into the United States because things were that bad. If you can imagine a parent sending an 11 year old on a 1600 mile journey, uh, in many cases on their own or with a bigger brother or cousin. And also it, uh, the war on drugs help f helps finance terrorist groups and civil wars. So again, it's, it has a tremendous negative effect throughout the economy, and it negatively affects everybody, either directly or as a taxpayer, because this war on drugs is very expensive. Um, um, the conclusions of the Austrian analysis is that there are no benefits. So economists very often are called on to produce cost-benefit analysis. You know, what are our benefits and what are our costs? And in my view, there are no benefits. There's basically no benefits. Uh, admittedly, there are going to be a few people who are discouraged from getting into the war, getting into the illegal drug markets because of their concern about a criminal record, their uh, image, and so on, um, or that their parents might find out, and so on. Uh, but these people are never going to be really troublemakers as drug consumers. So it's all cost and no benefit. And the cost of the war on drugs are much larger than is typically estimated by social scientists. The good thing, as I pointed out in the demographics issue, is that more and more people are coming to understand the fact that the war on drugs doesn't have any benefits. It's systematically destroying people's lives, and it's not helping anybody, and it's creating new drugs every day that are more dangerous than previously existed. And people are uh, coming to understand that. Me most people, I think, have uh, had direct negative experiences either themselves or someone in their family, or someone in their friend groups who have experienced severe negative consequences uh, as a result of the war on drugs. And more importantly, they understand that legalization would not be an utter disaster. Because, and, and this is something I've been working on lately and, and continue to do so, in the absence of the war on drugs, that doesn't mean there are no constraints. There are still lots of constraints that the free society imposes on drug abuse. So it's not like we get rid of the war on drugs and there's no constraints on people's behavior. If we legalized marijuana in Alabama, that does not mean that Lou Rockwell is going to let, let you light up a joint during my lecture. <laughs> so that's not going to happen. So churches can prohibit uh, certain types of behavior on their property. Lou Rockwell can prohibit certain types of behavior on his property. You know, if you go into a convenience store and it says, no shirt, no shoes, no service, they can enforce that on their customers. And they basically have to, because if, if people start 
not wearing shoes and cutting their feet and suing the convenience store, the, the convenience store's insurance company is going to come down hard on them. So it's not just like there's no constraints and, oh, I can impose constraints if I want to. No, there's systematic reasons why there are going to be systematic constraints on people's behavior. Drug users, alcoholics typically don't progress in, in, in the job market. They tend not to get the opportunities to advance and get promoted. So there's an economic cost to bad behavior systematically throughout the free society. So that's a very important point to remember and to make is that prohibition is not the only constraint. And in a free society with no prohibitions on consumption, there would be a whole host of existing and new constraints on people's behavior. Okay, we got a few minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Do you feel like the Rave Act should be amended? The, the Rave Act? Do you know that? No. It's the Reducing American uh, Vulnerability to Ecstasy Act. It has led to such uh, new designer drugs such as ethylone, methylone, PMA, PMMA. It has led to more overdoses in what has been sold as Molly or Ecstasy instead of uh, pure MDMA, which has been uh, shown in other tests to be much cleaner and safer to uh, many users. Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that that should be amended. And, and actually, um, there's been a lot of evidence to suggest that pharmaceutical ecstasy um, is a highly valuable drug and can be um, used to address a whole number of different issues. And that's exactly the type of thing that I'm, I'm talking about. When you prohibit something, the black market will find its way around those prohib prohibitions and the results will be much more costly. So that's one of the first things that's going to fall after marijuana, maybe even in the process of it, because a lot of people who used to be uh, opposed to legalized ecstasy have now found that, wow, there's a lot of really important uses for it and medical uses, uh, <clears throat> and the effect of the prohibition has been entirely negative because of these substitutes. Yes? Uh, is there a reason why uh, in many you know, states where there's a legalization going, let's say, Netherlands and Amsterdam, there's still a black market anyway, taking their you know, path of pricing, basically, you know, they take it out of pricing. Yeah, there, the question is about why is there still black market in places where um, the drugs are somewhat legalized. Uh, this, ha this is really happening systematically. Uh, in Colorado, uh, drug legalization has not shut down the black market. And most of the black market is still, is still there. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that, well, you've got all these rules and regulations and taxes and licensing that you have to um, comply with. And plus the fact that um, under these restricted conditions, uh, the price that legal marijuana is being sold at is still pretty high. And so there's still a, that profit margin there for the illegal growers. And so a lot of it has to do with the fact that we haven't legalized fully enough. Um, and as a result, the black market continues. Just to make sure I agree with everything you said, I'm a little bit tired, but there is a kind of mind to say that if we legalize drugs, the criminals who deal with drugs today will go to other types of real crimes like rape, but how would you address this kind of Yeah, what if um, the black marketeers turn to property crimes uh, and violence and things of that nature? Uh, that's a distinct possibility in the short run. Um, we have seen evidence that uh, the bootleggers of the 1920s and 1930s, when they were forced out of those bootlegging uh, jobs, that they did turn to robbing banks and things like that. Uh, but it was transitory. It, it was only temporary. Um, and so if we truly legalize uh, a marketplace and drive out all the black market people, 
uh, there is going to be that transitory problem that they'll turn to other forms of crime because they've learned to be good at crime. They've learned how to use a weapon. They've learned how to be secretive. Um, and so we should expect some of that to happen, but the, the overwhelming factor is going to be that if we cut law enforcement loose from having to prosecute the war on drugs and we instead prioritize them to protect property and to protect people, that that type of transitory crime should be quickly suppressed. One more? Oh, no, we're out of time. Thank you very much.